Welcome to the Excruciating Minutiae Podcast, where we obsess about sports, pop culture, and politics, but mostly sports. Here are your hosts, Randy and Steven. Hello again, everybody. I'm Randy. I'll be joined shortly by Steven, and welcome again to another episode of Excruciating Minutia. And I'd like to ask before we begin that you go ahead and check us out at excruciatingpodcast.com where there are links to all of your favorite places where you'll be able to listen to us on a regular basis. And today we begin the first of a multi-part series where we're going to be looking back at the year 1989. And as you pointed out, Stephen, it's not just the Taylor Swift album for the millennials who weren't born back in 1989. We were both alive in 1989, and little did we know it at the time, but that turned out to be one heck of a year and very memorable in a number of ways that I really had no clue until you pointed it out to me and we realized, wow, lots of important stuff that year, lots of big events, right? We were talking about it and we started talking about a few of the items and they started building and then I started doing some research and I'm like, oh my God, all this happened in the same year? How is this even possible? And maybe every year will kind of look like that as we kind of look back, but I kind of looked at 88 and 90 on either side of it and they didn't seem to have the level of events and the number of huge events that 1989 had. It was a very big year historically. Uh, It was a big year in pop culture. There was a lot of things that happened that year that even 30 years later, they're still relevant. And I think that's what kind of struck me the most as I was doing the research and and putting the list together. The amazing thing was, as as you sent me this list and I started looking and just you know, one of the first things we're going to touch on are important events in the world, the major happenings. And there were a couple of these things that there were multiple ones that could have been literally one of the biggest, if not the biggest story of any given year that was competing with other things that were of such magnitude that they could be the biggest story of any given year. And then we started looking through the TV shows and it was like, wow, that's some iconic things that were going on both on the top shows and new shows we looked at the movie list and it's a geez i i don't remember all these movies releasing that year but it must have been murder at the box office as these films went up against one another but again a lot of classics things we remember today same thing with music same thing with sports like you said just an incredible year and we didn't know it at the time but It just makes me feel older when I look back and realize it is 30 years. It's 30 year anniversary. And that just makes me feel old, which kind of ties in because Lethal Weapon 2 was one of the movies that came out that year. And I I think Danny Glover expressed it best, right? You're getting too old for this shit. But we're not getting too old to, to look back. Our memories are still good enough to at least be refreshed and remember our own recollections of some of these things. So uh, let's say we start with world events. And the first one we have here, the fall of the Berlin Wall was in 1989. And at first, your thoughts, where were you or what what do you remember about that? Because that was the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union and the, and the communist regimes in Eastern Europe. It had already started kind of coming apart at the seams. But that, I think, was the seminal moment where we knew the world was changing forever at that point. I mean, what are your thoughts or remembrances of that? I will say this. Part of my problem with putting this together is I don't really remember. A, I mean, I remember a lot of them after the fact. Like, you know, obviously we all know about the Berlin Wall and some of the other incidents we'll be talking about. But I don't remember them happening at the time. I'm trying to think of like, where was I in 1989, right? So, so I'm thinking back, I was living in Connecticut, I believe at the time and managing a bike shop. And that was a lot of hours in the day. I was working probably 10 hours a day. Plus I was riding my bike a lot. I don't know that I was watching a ton of news. I was never around at the time that news was on. You heard about things and you kind of saw things, but I don't remember it. I remember it much more after the fact, like I remember, you know, seeing the videos afterwards. I'm slightly younger than you. 
not by much, but I'm a little bit younger than you. I was in college at the time, and I remember very distinctly. See, there, I guess there's the difference between you having a, you know, a job that was requiring you to work a lot of hours potentially and taking up more of your time and me being a college student who had a little bit more free time on his hands because this was pre my first real, real important job was bartending. But this is, I believe, prior to that, I was living with my aunt at the time who you've met and you know the aunt I'm speaking of. And I remember being home and I watched a lot of news at the time for even for a 19 year old. And there weren't the plethora of news stations or cable outlet stations or or places to watch things at the time. It was pretty much your networks and CNN were what was going on back in 89. And I remember watching the wall as it was coming down live. And it was something that had me transfixed because I was a student of history even back then and still am a big history buff. And it was brought up. I mean, the the understanding was if you're growing up and you're growing up in that Cold War environment that, you know, you have the Soviets, you have the communists on that side, you have the democracies and you have the free world led by the U.S. and to a lesser extent, England and Europe. But, you know in France and your other democracies or other free nations. And you always had that feeling that was that this is the way it's going to be them on that side, us on our side. And, you know, the scary thought at the time, of course, we, you know, we mentioned it in a previous podcast, you know, nuclear annihilation, nuclear war. Eventually there's going to be a a big military conflict between the East and the West. And then, You know, Germany, of course, split up by the Berlin Wall and East Germany and West Germany. And, you know, you read about in the history books, Germany was separated, of course, after World War II. And that was never going to happen where they were going to reunify. It didn't matter what the people thought. The Soviet Union had their control over East Germany. and, And, you know, this is the way the world was. And on this one night, you're watching people climbing the wall hammering at it with, you know, hammers and crowbars and, and jumping the wall and people from one side embracing people from the other side and no one is shooting. You remember that was the thing. If you tried to go across the Berlin wall, you got gunned down. The soldiers that were there to protect the wall and to keep people from escaping would gun you down. Correct. I mean, that was that. That's right. the way it worked. There are pictures out there somewhere of people that were caught in like barbed wires. They were trying to escape, and the guards that were guarding would would shoot them, and that would be that. And you realize this is going on, and nothing's happening. And I just remember thinking, even as a nineteen year old, what does this mean? This is such a an event that I don't think anyone could have predicted was going to happen. One of the, the famous quotes from Ronald Reagan when he was president, he had visited Berlin and uh, had visited Germany, and he had made the statement, you know, this was in the beginning of his and Gorbachev's uh, relations and trying to, to move past the, the Cold War tensions, and he made the comment, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And the comment was kind of mocked a little bit because it's like, well, that's never going to happen. And then a couple years later, here was the wall being torn down. That's how much of a jump in history it went from just a few years before to uh, to this new world where anything might have been possible. And, you know, I, I just remember being floored by I, like I knew immediately watching it that it was something that was historically relevant. It was something we would remember 30 years later, and it would be one of those moments in my lifetime that I probably wouldn't forget. Again, it's a different impact if you saw it as it was happening than, like you said, if you saw it after the fact. But certainly in world history events, that was not the complete end of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, because that isn't something that happened overnight. This was kind of in the middle, I believe, had in Romania or or Czechoslovakia had kind of started happening. before. It happened pretty quickly because it happened you know, quickly, but it, it wasn't a one night thing. It wasn't like the next night everything was gone. No, it was like a two month thing. Yeah. I mean, that's the crazy thing about this. So 
you know, the Berlin Wall was the night of November 9th, 1989. Okay. Do you remember what caused that incident to happen? Like, why did they start tearing the wall down? They had, I believe, East Germany had allowed people for the first time to be able to go no. right and they what what exactly kind of so what happened was the uh the the socialist party chief of berlin had made an announcement at a press conference on that day on the 9th that travel restrictions for east german citizens would be lifted and the east germans took that to mean immediately so they all just went to the wall and started tearing it down um, that day, I don't remember that that exactly sparked it off. And that wasn't their intent. Their intent was to say that they were planning on doing this in an orderly fashion. But the minute they opened their mouth about this, all the East Germans just ran to the wall and just started chiseling at it and pushing on it and climbing on it. And you're right. Up until that day, if they had done that, they would have been shot, right? You you didn't even have to get to the wall if you got close to the wall, because if I remember right, there was like this rolled barbed wire and then the wall, and then there was a gap in between. So if you crossed over the barbed wire, that at that point, you were going to be shot. Yeah, you couldn't take a long stick and pole vault it. Yeah, there was, there was definitely space in between the wall and other barriers that would slow you down and keep you from even getting to crossing into the West. Even those East German athletes who were taking, you know, horse tranquilizers <laughs> couldn't, you know, get over the wall. Yeah, but... But I, I and I'm talking about, I'm talking about the women. I'm not even talking <laughs> about the men. So yeah. that's a huge world event because, it, like I said, it, it, it we remember a lot of things about the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of things about the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, and this is kind of I think the one moment that sticks out for most people who remember it is is when the Berlin Wall came down because that's when all the thoughts of you know, we already know how this is going to play out. It's going to end in some terrible military struggle and lots of people are going to die and it's and we might all die in a nuclear war and all this. This was the moment where I, people like myself were like, maybe there is a brighter future. You know, there's there's something better to look forward to. And, and in the end, freedom and you know democracy won out like it has throughout history in many examples. And it was temporarily in some places like you know there have been in, in germany it has been but you know you've now seen some of those eastern bloc countries become a lot more authoritarian they did become democratic for a short period of time but they are now trending in the opposite direction uh you know russia of course being one of them but uh but even places like Hungary and Poland, they've they've elected far right candidates who are very much autocrats. I will say the one thing about the reunification of Germany, which took place years later. And and again, I'm, I'm not going to say we can draw any lessons from this or or what it means. But even to this day, there is a huge disconnect. And, you know, it's the old adage. Sometimes be careful what you wish for. There's a huge disconnect between the East German and West German parts of Germany in that the economy in the East under the communist regime was so backwards and so far behind that of the West that the economic structure in Germany still has never recovered. And we're talking about 30 years that the East German sector of Berlin and the East German sector of the country it just is far is still far behind what used to be West Germany to the point where there are people that live in West Germany who almost feel like, you know, maybe it would have been better if we'd stayed separate countries. And of course, no one in Germany at the time would have wanted that back then. You know, there is a little bit of irony that it's been 30 years. And to some extent, Germany still feels, I think, like two separate countries to the people who live in it as far, at least from an economic standpoint. But in any year, that certainly could have been the biggest story, right? News story. But just on a similar vein, there was a protest, you know, because at the time you saw what was going on in the communist bloc of Eastern Europe and you saw countries rising up against their leaders and demanding freedom and being successful. And that happened in China. And that didn't quite go so well because that was also a big event from 89 Tiananmen Square and the massacre there. And you mentioned uh, the aforementioned uh, tank man, the gentleman 
who still has never been identified, who walked out in front of that tank in a moment that was captured on TV. And that is still an incredible visual in people's mind. Again, another huge news story, not even the biggest news story of the year, but kind of tangently related to what happened in Eastern Europe, because again, a communist state with people trying to rise up against it. But that, like I said, didn't quite go so well in China, did it? And certainly not for Tank Man. Well, they say Tank Man survived, that he was not run over and that he actually did. That's what the they claim. Who claims he's okay? <laughs> it wasn't the government. It was people outside oh, okay. the government. But we don't know how many people were actually killed during the massacre that happened in Tiananmen Square. No one has really been able to put a, a figure on how many people that was. And it just led to more of a crackdown. China is a weird place in that they've had these moments when they've kind of loosened and then they get somebody new in. Like right now, Chairman Xi, who is in charge, is now president for life, right? He basically got a law passed that he can be the president forever. And he's not really a president in the sense that we know of as a president. He's basically the dictator. And it was very much a communist country, and now there's a lot of free enterprise there, but they still really don't have a lot of personal freedoms. I work in a school district, and we have a number of our teachers who go over there almost on a yearly basis. There's an exchange program, and so they'll go and spend 10 days there and you know, talking with people at different schools, etc. But you know, they go there, they can't post on to Twitter. The internet is kind of tamped down. They can't, they don't have free access to, to things. Whenever they go in a group, there's somebody from the government who is tagging along and making sure that they don't do what they're not supposed to be doing. There are certain places where they don't want you taking pictures. So if they catch you taking a picture, they take your camera out of your hand and they delete the picture and hand you your camera back your cell phone nowadays. In the old days, they would just take your camera and they'd take the film out of it and hand you your camera back. Now they can just delete the photos off your phone. It's just a weird place. But that was a monumental moment, right? And no matter what you talk about, you know, things that have happened in recent Chinese history, that is the one moment that everybody remembers. Oh, absolutely. That man standing in front of that tank. And when the tank moved, he moved to stay in front of it. And it was a very poignant moment in television that we all will remember. All of us who saw it will remember forever. It's an inspirational moment because it was literally one man standing up against the might of the Chinese army represented by that tank. And I don't know what that man was thinking. No one will know maybe what that man was thinking other than the people who who knew him at the time. But it was a very strong moment, like you said. I, I still I can picture it, not even looking at it online or on you know on YouTube or wherever I, I could find it. I visually remember the image. And like you said, it was him standing up and it was an incredibly powerful moment. And you're right, the Tiananmen Square everything that went around it, that's the moment we remember about it. And 30 years later, we remember that man standing in front of that tank. You mentioned the death toll. The Chinese government, according to what I'm reading, official Chinese government announcements, I guess at the time, said that the number of people killed during the entire Tiananmen Square protests and incident was between zero and 300. I I love the fact that zero would have been potentially a number. In 2014, U.S. government files that were declassified estimated that the death toll was over 10,000, with 40,000 injured. And apparently, they pulled that figure from internal Chinese government files that they had obtained from the Chinese government headquarters, how they got them, how they didn't, I'm not sure. Britain government files that were declassified in December 2017 estimated civilian death toll at 10,000. Again, a very, very big event in world history. And it's kind of the counterpart to what happened with the Soviet Union. Those protests succeeded. That government fell. That dictatorship fell. That communist regime fell. The Chinese one didn't. And you're right. China is kind of a a weird amalgam. They, they have some freedoms. They have Western culture influences. They do have some things, but it's still very much 
as you put it, a communist state and doing things there is not like doing things here. And and it won't be. And the Soviet Union, I, there was a time I would have said the Soviet Union was never going to collapse, except now that we know the inner workings and what was going on at the time, it was inevitable they were going to collapse. I don't get that feeling that that's what's going to happen in China. I guess there could be another uprising someday, but who knows wh- where that will end up leading or if we will have another tank man or another Tiananmen Square in our lifetime. I wouldn't say so, but then again, I wouldn't have expected to have seen the first one happen because, again, at the time, it was kind of unheard of that people would protest in such a way and, and it would gain the the steam that it did. Again, a huge world event, as you mentioned, but look at the other one. Look on our list we have here. What's under the fall of the Berlin Wall? The beginning of the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. That's kind of a big deal. And again, that would have been like the biggest story in the world on any other given year, potentially. Right. And here it is. It's maybe top three, as we're saying. Right. How do you remember that playing out at the time? That was kind of a slow roller. That one didn't happen really fast. It started at the end of 89. And then finally, the president, actually in, 19, in the beginning of 1990, he, uh, Willem de Klerk, uh, ended the ban on the African National Congress, which essentially ended government enforced segregation. Obviously, there's still segregation going on. Then shortly after that, again, in 1990, but Early in 1990, Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. It was not an immediate process because the first election where everyone could vote was 1994. That's when everybody was allowed to vote in the general elections then. And there were negotiations, I guess, between the government and the anti-apartheid contingent talking about how they would go about ending apartheid in South Africa. So it wasn't an immediate thing, and it certainly didn't happen as quickly as, let's say, the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe did. But again, that was a major change because my knowledge of apartheid in South Africa usually came because we were both big sports fans, and we both are, is when South African athletes would be ostracized or would be not allowed to compete in certain things, correct? As long as apartheid was going on, that was the thing. I remember, you know, I was a big boxing fan in the 80s. And, you know, that was, uh, what was it? Uh, Jerry Coetzee, who briefly yes. held one of the heavyweight championship belts, who wasn't Larry Holmes. You know, I remember him uh, as a fighting, you know, for one of the heavyweight titles. And, you know, they were talking about the apartheid in South Africa. And, you know, wherever he went, it didn't matter if he was in favor of it or not. You know, there were protests around that. Weren't they uh, barred in some fashion from competing in the Olympics or for 32 years after 1960 Olympics? And they were not allowed back until after apartheid uh, ended. So that was kind of my introduction to what apartheid was. Again, as a teenager growing up in the 80s, that's where I learned from it was from sports because it came up in sporting events. And like you said, why, why are there no South African athletes here? Well, because of this. And that was a huge major change. And it's a top three. You know, it's not as big as the Berlin Wall. It's probably not as big as Tiananmen Square. But it would have been, you said 88 and 90 when you were looking at those years were, were not nearly as big. Could that have been like maybe the big story of either one of those years or, or the seminal historical moment? Maybe so. And here it is on a list where we have other things that were big. 1989, we had the um, earthquake in San Francisco was one of the first major American earthquakes in years. Again, they always talked about there being a uh, potential for a big earthquake on the West Coast, right? And there still is today. Everybody you know, talks about the big one eventually hitting out there. Well, that was kind of a big one, wasn't it? And it was televised because we were watching the World Series at the time when it took place. It was right before the game started. So it was during the pregame introductions. Because yeah. I remember Al Michaels was calling the game and He basically was calling it. I mean, he was giving a play by play of the earthquake. And of course, they lost their signal for a brief period of time and then came back. And, you know, all the players and their families were were standing on the field and they had no idea 
the devastation that had happened outside of the stadium because the stadium actually was fine but obviously you know buildings collapsed fires the bridge collapsed if you remember the bay bridge and they all said the nimitz freeway in oakland had collapsed and they said Mm -hmm. the world series probably saved a number of lives because they had a lot of transportation structures that had failures like the nimitz freeways but rush hour traffic was lighter because of the game So people had already gone home early or were staying at work later and they didn't want to fight traffic or for whatever reason, that probably helped keep the loss of life a little bit lower. Right. Because that would have been rush hour because it's a West Coast. It was a eight o'clock East Coast start. Five oh four is the official time. And right before first pitch, which was some which usually somewhere around eight ten or thereabouts. So that was a little surreal. I think, what, did they have to wait, like 10 days before they could start the series up again? Of course, the, uh, the Giants wish they never started the series back yeah. up. But. That was the 6.9 on the official scale for magnitude. To give a comparison, uh, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which pretty much leveled the entire city, was a 7.9. So it wasn't quite as strong as that. But 6.9 is nothing to sneeze at, obviously. There were only, and you know, I I say only, and this is not a good number because obviously the best number of fatalities in something like this would be zero, but there were only 63 deaths. There were a little bit over 3,700 injuries, according to the official reports. You know, lots of damage, but they had built in San Francisco, much like they do, I'm sure, in Los Angeles, buildings better suited to take the effects of earthquakes. And I remember watching it, li- like you said, live on TV because I was watching the World Series game and they were like, oh, it's an earthquake. And it was kind of jovial at first. You know, the fans cheered, right? They were, oh, you know, all excited because it's like the stadium had shook. And then people started realizing, wait a minute, this is actually kind of serious. And then it got very, you know, the, the sports reporting going on by the people from ABC, as you mentioned, Al Michaels and crew, all of a sudden turned into a, impromptu news reporting of the event again it, it's just something i'll never forget watching that on tv and then watching my sporting event turned into a news event live right in front of my eyes so that was a big big deal something that would have been a the biggest story in the at least in the united states it could have been the biggest story and again it, it's not even necessarily top three in the world that we can think of for that year so more of a sign of what a what a year that was. Other events that happened that year. The Exxon Valdez spill was that year. You know, a huge environmental disaster. Uh, that captain, has he sobered up since then? Because he was drunk, wasn't he? The one uh, pilot in the Exxon Valdez? He had a few drinks while he was supposed to be at the helm, and he was not at the helm at the time. It ran aground off the coast of Alaska and dropped, oh, I don't know, what was it, 300,000 barrels of oil, something in that vicinity. That's a lot of oil. Yeah, and uh, caused a lot of damage. 1,300 miles of shoreline was impacted. It was 260,000 barrels. That's a lot of oil. That's, that's yes. a lot of gasoline you can make out of that. That's a lot of oil, caused a lot of problems. That was a big fishing area. You know, keep in mind that off the coast of Alaska, a lot of commercial fishing up there, and that really just killed that industry for a period of time. A uh, lot of damage done. That was Captain Joseph Hazelwood that was hmm. the name of the captain who was a little bit tipsy. It's one of many of our ecological disasters you had one down there not too long ago with the Deepwater Horizon spill. Yep. You know, there's been others over time. There's the Three Mile Island accident. There was the Chernobyl. Chernobyl. You had the Bhopal disaster with the uh, Union. Oh, Union Carbide, the cyanide release. Yeah. Yes. You've had some of these types of, you know, I don't think anyone died. Not any people died from the Exxon Valdez spill, but a lot of wildlife sure did. That was a huge, huge event. And again, 1989, all these things happened. I was going to say, as a complete trivia, uh, if, if this is correct, and I haven't seen the movie in a long time, but just doing a quick reading here, 
apparently in the film Waterworld, you remember that film, uh, the bad guy's villain, the main villain of the movie, uh, the Exxon Valdez is his flagship. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> There's some trivia I never would have guessed. <laughs> nope. <laughs> but you just mentioned a bunch of ecological disasters over history, and that's one of the ones 30 years later, when you mention Exxon Valdez, people know exactly what you're talking about. They still remember it to this day. Whereas some of the other ones you mentioned, you know, like the Union Carbide one, I remember that happening, you know, or making it into the news. And that resulted in a large number of deaths, did it not? I mean, that was over 15,000. Yeah. And yet, if you ask people about that and you ask people about the Exxon Valdez, people remember the Exxon Valdez, but people have probably forgotten about the Union Carbide disaster. I didn't remember it until you just mentioned it. Yeah. Once you mentioned it, then it came back to mind. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember how terrible that was. But like I said, Exxon Valdez, the minute I saw it on the list, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I just didn't remember it was in 89. But of course, everything seemed to happen in 89, according to this. Other disasters. And again, you know, a lot of these things were captured on television. And that's something that helps us to remember these things and look back at them even better. We mentioned I saw the Berlin Wall episode on TV. We all saw the Tank Man and Tiananmen Square. Exxon Valdez coverage was very, very extensive. You have on here the Sioux City, Iowa, U.S. Airlines flight crash, Flight 232. And for anyone who doesn't remember it, then I'll just ask anyone if you Google it or you know put it on YouTube, you'll see an airplane cartwheeling down the runway. And that was, again, captured live on television as this plane, since I'm the air accident expert on our podcast, I'll give a quick synopsis. Flight 232 was a DC-10. It was traveling across the Midwest. There was a rotary blade, I believe, in one of the engines that had defect in it from when it was manufactured, shattered, flew back, parts of the engine came apart, and a piece went back and basically severed the hydraulic cables, which are the way you control an airplane, at least as far as your rudder and your tail. And that's how you steer your plane and make it go up and down and left and right. And all those controls were severed. So you basically had a DC-10 that was uncontrollable. And pretty much every time that that happens, a plane like that in that position is going to crash. Except the pilots of this plane managed to use engine thrust to control the plane as best as they could. Got it to Sioux City, Iowa. Tried to land it, but they were coming in too fast because they needed the engines up to be able to keep the plane doing what they needed it to do. The plane dipped at the last moment. The wing caught the ground. And then there's this video image of the plane cartwheeling down the runway and bursting into flames. That was live on television and covered because everyone knew the plane was in trouble and it was headed in for an emergency landing. So all of that footage was there. How often do we see plane accidents caught on film? You know, very rarely, if ever, right? Even in today's world. That, again, I remember seeing that and that footage being replayed over and over and over again. Miraculously, people survived that accident thanks to the pilots. And, uh, you know, what a testament to their ability to keep that plane in the air as long as they did. Because, like I said, under normal circumstances, when you lose those type of controls in an airplane, that's game over. Your plane goes down. And yet they ended up with a decent number of fatalities in that. They had 111, but they had 100, I believe it's like 180 something survivors. Yeah, 111 people passed away. 185 survived. And you mentioned that they had that failure of the engine. That was, if, if you know anything about planes, that had two wing engines, uh, one on each wing, and then a third engine in the Back tail. The tail. And it was the tail engine that basically disintegrated and destroyed the hydraulics. Pretty soon after that, they stopped using DC-10s for passenger flights. Uh, however, they still use them to this day for cargo flights. I see them all the time because I'm in the flight path of uh, Newark Airport here in New Jersey. So I see planes fly overhead all the time. And uh, both FedEx and UPS have DC-10s that they still fly to this day. One of these days, we'll do end up doing a podcast talk on my as you would put it, irrational fear of flying. <laughs> and and we will probably end up talking about air safety or air crash 
history or something like that. Because I could talk at length about that. Because as I've said before, I'm I'm a student of aviation accident history. Uh, and I can tell you that the DC-10, if you ask pilots, pilots almost unanimously say it's a really good plane. The problem was, and the reason you said that they got rid of it for commercial flights, but it's still being used today, is because it's a really good plane, but it had a horrible reputation amongst flyers. People literally did not want to get on DC-10s, and it was a string of accidents and problems with the plane throughout its early history in the 70s when it was introduced. And essentially, the who, who made the DC-10? Wasn't it McDonnell Douglas, I think, was the... Uh, the manufacturer for the DC-10? Yes. And they were in competition with Boeing, and there's a reason Boeing is still around and McDonnell Douglas isn't, because you know the, the failure of the DC-10 kind of sunk McDonnell Douglas as a manufacturer of aircraft, but it had a horrible reputation in the late 70s. And like I said, people literally would look and they'd see, what, what, what am I booked on? A DC-10? I'm changing my flight. I don't want to get on that plane. Not all the plane's fault, but... You know, this was yet another accident involving it. And as you said, it wasn't long after this that you just didn't see them in the air anymore as far as commercial flights. But you're right. Commercially, they're still used today. So another major event. One thing that's a common theme here is we keep talking about things that happened on TV. Right. Things that we were able to live and relive and rewatch as they took place live in front of us. There were other things that didn't take place that were some pretty big events that year that weren't necessarily live or right there on television. The savings and loan crisis was in 1989. That was kind of a big deal. The bailout. The bailout and also the Keating Five Senate Ethics Committee investigation, which was basically, you know, five major senators who were accused of improperly intervening on behalf of Charles Keating, who was the chairman of Lincoln Savings and Loan Association, which failed in 1989. It cost the government over $3 billion and left 23,000 customers with worthless bonds. I know this story well. One of my best friends is from Rhode Island. His parents lost a ton of money in that collapse. And, uh, They had come to visit us. We were living in an apartment in Connecticut, and his parents had come and spent the weekend at our apartment, and I sent them a bill, you know, as a joke, and he sent me a check, and I was, like, so excited that I got a check, you know, that he was really going to give us some money, and my friend was like, that's not going to be any good, and it was a Lincoln Savings check. Oh, geez. (laughs) It was a check to an account that literally was worthless. But that was like the, I'm trying to think when that happened. That was probably like 92, 93 that happened. So that was a few years afterwards, I guess, long enough afterwards that he could make a joke about it, but they lost most of their life savings. Sad story. Yeah. Yeah. There were so many people whose retirements and future plans were just ruined by that. And again, it's a story that almost gets lost in some of these other even bigger events. But again, part of what was going on in 1989 We've mentioned a lot of bad things happening. Some of these things weren't necessarily all terrible because I see uh, Ted Bundy was executed in 1989. And whether or not you believe in capital punishment or you don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with the thought that the world was a better place without Ted Bundy in it at that point in time. Ted Bundy, arguably the most famous serial killer in U.S. history, certainly one of the most charismatic serial killers in u.s history i mean it's he was the best looking one in u.s history played by mark Harmon in a movie showing uh you know they had to get someone with the charm and the good looks of mark Harmon to play him a guy who was defined the uh, perfect definition of the word psychopath he was just a really really bad man just you know they're making another ted bundy movie by the way are they yeah he's going to be played by zach efron Really? Speaking of good looking guys, not that there's anything wrong with that. No, not that. No, not at all. Not at all. He confessed to 30 homicides. It's more than likely than not. It's more than that. And he was a complete sociopath. I've heard people in the past say 
you know, that terms like good and evil don't really apply. And, you know, there are shades of gray. And I, I largely believe that, but with some exceptions, there are people in this world that are literally pure evil. And whether, you know, it's a genetic thing or it's an environmentalist thing as far as how you're brought up or it's a combination or, you know, what screw gets loose in somebody. Bundy was one of those guys that was just a, like I said, just a scary individual to know that he looked like the guy next door, right? The boy next door and could be very normal and by all appearances, nothing suspicious, nothing that would make you think he was off. He could fit in in society very well. And yet here he was, this horrible human being capable of these terrible, terrible acts. That's scary. I know you don't like horror movies and I do. I think I've told you before. It's like, I've never been scared watching a horror movie. To me, it's scarier to think that people like a Bundy, you know, walk the streets today, probably because, you know, there, there's a Ted Bundy out there somewhere right now who's blending in and, and is an awful human being behind the scenes. And that's, that's a scary thing. But 89 was the end of that. No paroles, no escape. And he had escaped from prison at least on two occasions, I believe. Right. And before he ended up in Florida, he had escaped from prison. But 30 years later, they're remaking a movie about it. And there was a documentary about it just recently. I guess with all these TV channels and everything, they have to create content. They could give us a show. We, we could provide some content, <laughs> yeah. but, you know. We certainly could. I guess we're not, we certainly guess we're not as uh, intriguing as, uh, and definitely not as good looking as Ted Bundy. Speak for yourself about the good looking part. I mean, you know. Ask your wife. He's much better looking than you. I've definitely killed fewer people than Way Ted Bundy. Way fewer. I have killed somewhere between zero and 29. <laughs> somewhere between zero <laughs> and 29. <laughs> yes. I, I was going to say, note, note the fact where I just said I've killed fewer people than Ted Bundy, but I did not specify an actual number is that what you're you and i are both saying <laughs> uh well moving on we've killed fewer people than eric and lyle menendez did that was the year they murdered their parents that was a big news story or a big crime story speaking of other reprehensible human beings that was a big story at the time other people that uh died that year that I, i'm not really sure the world was sad to see go the ayatollah khomeini died that year a big world leader who, of course, everyone remembers from the Iran hostage crisis and the leader of the Iranian government and dead in 1989. Uh, Solomon Rushdie was that year. And uh, he wrote the satanic verses and then immediately had to go into hiding as he was targeted for death for writing that. You know, that's always scary. I hope no one is targeting us for death for anything that we're saying during the course of this podcast. That would be a little frightening. Yeah. Going back to the Menendez murders, okay? Last year, just last year, again, 29 years after their murder and 28 after the court case, Law & Order did a whole series on them. They did a Law & Order true crime, the Menendez murders. They did like a mini series on it. And that was just last year. It's still uh, one of those cases 30 years later that people are still kind of intrigued. It was one of the first court cases where we actually watched it on TV, right? They were tried on TV. That was the beginning of court TV. At the time, you're right, because previously when you'd had big trials, what did you used to see? Cameras were not allowed in the courtroom. You'd have the court person drawing. What is it? The court uh, cartoonist, it felt like, or the court artist. Yes. You know, yes. Who, and you'd see these still pictures on the news of, you know, these people, so-and-so sitting at the defense chair or whatever, or the judge or whatever. And that's how you saw a trial get covered. And then court TV came along and, and all the cable channels. And, you, and you're right. That sort of stuff all of a sudden became must-see TV which we, we saw in a big way once the OJ trial hit. You know, that was really the culmination of watching, you know, real life drama as far as, uh, you know, true crime play out right in front of you on television. But you're right. I do remember that being a big deal on television and not, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that's a good thing. That's it, was that kind of like the beginnings of what would turn into reality television in many aspects when you when we started seeing things like this showing up on regular television? Uh, I feel like the beginnings of reality television was the MTV real world. That was really where and that was a few years later. 
the Eric and Lyle Menendez was the first, like you said, the first time we were allowed into the courtroom. Before that, we just didn't see it. And then it became a little, a lot more commonplace because you said we saw the OJ trial. We've seen other trials since then. But that was the first. That's a pretty seminal moment in TV and crime history. I don't know if it's for good or bad, but it's definitely a moment. I'm going to throw something out there. I'm going to throw a theory out there as we'll we'll wrap up this first part because we still have so much more to talk about as far as 1989 goes. We are just scratching the surface. So as we end this first part of our look back at 1989, I'll throw this theory out there. Listen to some of the things we've talked about. The Berlin Wall covered live on television, dramatic real world events, Tiananmen Square covered on television exclusively, dramatic real world elements, the savings and loan crisis and bailout, those investigations that was covered on television, apartheid, you know, the dismantling and, and protests and what was going on there covered live on television, the air crash in Sioux City that happened live on TV. We saw it, the earthquake. All of these things, the the Menendez brothers, these things were all big events. And as you said, they've all captured our imagination. And we still remember them 30 years later. And we largely remember them because they played out on television. Up until that point, TV had two different things. They had scripted television. Well, they had three things. Scripted television. You had your basic news, which, you know, you had CNN and you had your basic network news. And that was pretty much it. And the networks only covered news for brief periods during the day. And then you had sports, right? Sports was the one thing that was captivating to an audience because it was something that was not predetermined. It was unpredictable. Anything could happen, right? I always say that sports is the original reality television. Sports is the original reality television. And I would say that you could make that argument. I wonder how many TV executives looked at things like these events and looked at the ratings they got and realized people were watching and people were interested. There was an audience for these things and said, you know what? It doesn't have to be scripted for us to be able to get people to watch. We just need something dramatic and it can be real. It can be something that's actually happening in a real world environment, in real life to real people. It doesn't have to be some character we dreamed up for some TV show or even a sporting event. You know, I think this is some of this, the fact that we associate so many of these things with TV moments also is a sign of the way TV would influence the way things would go in years future. And, you know, again, reality television really started to take off much later than this and turned into, unfortunately, in many ways, the dominant programming on TV, which I don't think was to the quality of TV's benefit. Uh, We're going to talk about TV on our next uh, podcast about the year 1989, and you're not going to find a reality show. Well, you will. Actually, you'll find one we'll talk about. Yes, one. I think television and us remembering these events, I I think there's definitely a correlation there that being able to see a lot of the stuff live as it was happening added to the drama and is the reason that we remember these things today, even 30 years later, Uh, not just because they were big events and they were monumental events in this year. But I think television definitely had a a part to play in that. I think it did. There's no doubt about that. One uh, thing that you that we missed off of the list is we there was another disaster that year. It was sports related which was the Hillsborough disaster, which 96 uh, Liverpool soccer fans were crushed to death at a soccer match. That was back in the day when they didn't have assigned seats, so they just let way more people into a section than it could actually hold, and they had fencing up to prevent the fans from entering the field, and people literally just got crushed to death against the fence. And that was broadcast live in England. And that's why we have video uh, of it. ESPN thir- did a 30 for 30 on it, maybe a couple of years ago. And they're still litigating it to this day. 30 years later, there are still ongoing inquiries into the way that the police basically covered up what they did, which was not control the crowd, which is their job. They basically blamed all the supporters who got killed for causing the issue when it wasn't their fault. They were directed into the wrong entrance and nobody was really paying attention and just kept on 
forcing more and more people in, even though there was no place for them to go and there was no place for them to get out. I'll say that the one thing I took from that was whenever I go any place, if I'm surrounded by a crowd, you know, and it's a safety thing to mention is you always look for your exits and, you know, wherever you go, if you're, if you're with a lot of people, how do I get out of this place if I need to? And it's because, you know, you see a lot of these disasters where you get a lot of people crammed into a tight space and something happens and you see people get crushed to death. This wasn't exactly the same thing. Like you said, they just kept letting people into the stadium, funneled them the wrong way. And then the people who were already in just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed until there was no place for them to go. A terrible tragedy, but it did lead to reforms, I'm guessing, you know, throughout the way soccer oh, yeah, crowds yeah. were handled because of their large numbers, the way they, that this is done now. Right. Now there have to has to be a seat for every person that enters the stadium. There's a sign seating. There's no fencing now to prevent the fans from coming onto the field. It was they were more concerned about fans coming onto the field than they were fans getting, you know, pushed up against the fence. That stuff like this happens a lot in concerts in the pit when they have like standing room at the front near the stage is the stage typically has a, a fence in front. And then there's like a little walkway, which is where security goes. And then the, the stage, it happens a lot that uh, that there's a huge push and people at the front, you know, have to literally be pulled out by the security because otherwise they're just going to get crushed. It still does happen. They usually catch it before anyone dies. But yeah, 96 people and, and some of them kids. I think one of them was eight years old. It's been 30 years and they're still still litigating that and still fighting that. No one has been jailed for that. And now we're getting to the point where some of the people that were involved are getting so old that they're, you know, elderly. Dying of old point. age or will be so old that, that they won't that they won't put them in prison, even if they get yeah. sentenced to anything, because it'll be, you know, well, look how old he is. What good is this going to do at this point? But Everything we mentioned today, it's big events, it's important events, and yet by themselves, any one of them's big. When you add all this together, it was a year in 1989 of a lot of incredibly historically relevant events and things that we remember now. And a lot of these things we're still going to be talking about. Well, maybe not us, but somebody will be talking about probably 30 years from here, I would guess. So what we won't be talking about today, since we've run out of time for the most part, but we will be talking about on our next episode is, as we said, 1989 was a big, big year. So we're going to move away from the more serious elements, and then we're going to talk about some of the more fun elements. And it's mainly going to be some television and movies because, boy, there were some big TV shows. There were a heck of a lot of big movies. My God, when you sent me the list, I was stunned at some of the blockbusters and movies again we still remember today but that will be time on our next podcast so uh for steven i'm randy and i want to thank everybody for listening to us tonight again check us out on excruciatingpodcast.com for all the links to where to listen to us and please tune in to part two of our look at 1989 that'll be coming up next time until then have a good one Thank you for listening to the Excruciating Minutiae Podcast. Check us out at excruciatingpodcast.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms and follow us on Twitter at excruciatingpod. See you at the next episode.